Good morning. My name is Melissa Federhoff. I am the president of the Neshoba Valley Chamber of Commerce. And thank you all for joining us today. We are here with our chamber member, Lisa Miller of Free Media Web. And Lisa is going to present to us about um, search engine optimization. Thanks for having me today, Melissa. Uh, first thing, well, it seems like first thing on a Monday morning, but um, um, so I'm hoping that everybody here knows what local SEO is. Um, when, I, when I do SEO for, for ourselves or when I used to do it for clients, I always started with local first because local is where people are going to look for you first. So they're going to look for you, uh, what town you're in, and that helps you to later on grow your search. For example, my agency was in Southboro, so I went for Southboro searches. And then as my searches increased, I was able to expand, you know, to get to be on the first page of Google for Boston Web Design Company. So it can help you grow into expanded areas locally and then even nationally if you want to take it that far. So that is local SEO and that is why it's important is because people are always going to look for companies near them. And if they can't find you, then they're not gonna be coming to your company for that service. So I just wanted to put some stats out here just so people could see how important it is. When people search on Google, they have a 46% of searches with a local intent. So they are looking for somebody locally. And even in my business as a web design agency, people do look locally. So that still is really important to even my business, which is more of a service-based business, not a business to customer or consumer-based business like a store or a, or a, you know, a restaurant or something like that. 64% of local customers use search engines and directories as their main way to find local businesses. 50% of local mobile users look for business information like a company's address or phone number. And a whopping 78% of local mobile searches result in an offline purchase. So when looking at that final statistic, that is really important for businesses that possibly don't sell online. So restaurants, uh, museums, tourism-based businesses, you know, and even some other business-based service businesses. 78% result of the, of the searches result in a purchase. That's a very high statistic, and you don't see that in business-to-business -business searches at all. You see more like a two or a three percent if you're lucky. So this is why for certain types of businesses, this is so important. So there are three different types of ways that you can get found locally or in local SEO. First thing is Google Maps. And so I'm just gonna show you that quickly. Uh, the next is directories and citations, and I'll also go over those quickly. And the third is just the natural local SEO searches that you get on Google that don't have any kind of paid advertising to them. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is Google My Business, because I do think this is something that a lot of companies overlook and they don't give it the love that it really deserves. And from my experience, our Google My Business listing gets us a lot of business. It gets us found a lot of searches. It tells a really great story about our company. And I think everybody should be using it that way. And some of you might be, some of you might not be, but you can just see from these snapshots of these businesses that I've put up here, that you know, right away you can see their reviews, right away you can see where they're located, and you can see pictures. That's just in the snapshot when you do the, the first Google. And then on the right, you'll see more of um, chain businesses that have like multiple locations and you know could have different locations all around the state or wherever, but they they sort of tend to be bigger companies that list all their different locations so they're able to list more information they have like you know their pricing their their you know free wi-fi all that kind of stuff they're able to get those extra things into their listing just due to being um they're probably on different directories that they pay for and they probably have deals with google to show those kinds of things so that's why when you do google map and you're looking for a hotel you can right away see what their prices are and that's what people are looking for when they're doing a lo local search they want to know those immediate things that you might not need to know from like an accounting firm or a law firm or something like that 
So if you want to get on Google My Business, it is free. And I'm, again, not sure how many people here are already on it, but all you simply do is you go to Google, you search for your business, and it will allow you to set up a listing with them. And once you um, get the listing, you will receive a postcard in your, in your mailbox. Believe it or not, Google sends you a postcard <laughs> in this digital age. But they want to make sure that you have a physical listing. They, Google doesn't allow you to put a, um, a post office box in there. So once you um, go in here to claim your business, you want to fill out as much information as you can. And I've put the screenshot up here so everybody can see it. Uh, and this is a screenshot of my business as this is actually three or four weeks ago. Um, so you can see it says limited Google My Business functionality. And that has to do with the coronavirus. So right now, if you're asking anybody to review you on Google, and I think even if you're trying to update photos or anything uh, like that, they won't really allow you to do that right now. And I'm not really sure why that is. Maybe it's a fraud thing, but they're not allowing. Normally, you can do this stuff day and night. So it's limited right now, which is a great time for you to maybe start thinking about what you might change and what you might want to update. So, um, and you can see uh, some of my performance on here. I believe this was just for a a week or a few days. Um, so we had like 904 views, 819 searches. So of the 819 searches, we got 904 views. And you can just see the people maybe liking it or looking at our pictures or map views, different stuff like that. That's like almost 5,000 people. So that's a lot of people. <laughs> And so once you get all of your information filled out, the reviews is one of the main areas where you can really help your business shine. And all you need to do for reviews is ask people to review your business and they will just write a review, uh, put it up on Google and you can reply to it. You can, um, you can promote it on your social media channels. You can take it and you know, put it on your website as a testimonial. You can create graphics out of it and put it in a graphic and use that in social media. So getting these um, reviews is not only just great for Google, it's content you can use other places. But again, when people go back and search your local business, they're going to see your reviews like right away in the snapshot. It's going to say how many stars you are. So if, you're, if you don't have any reviews, it's not going to show any stars. If you have one review with five stars, it'll show the five stars. So it'll average out uh, what your reviews are. Uh, and I know that reviews are sometimes hard to get because clients don't always want to give them or they only usually want to give them if they have a bad experience. But there's lots of ways that you can uh, ask your customers to write you reviews. You can send them an email with the link to the reviews and you can even write the review for them and say, hey, you know, would you like to write a review? This is typically what somebody would write and then they could just post that. And uh, you can also, you know, reward them with a gift card after and say thank you. Uh, if you have a business that you're going to get tons and tons of reviews on, you probably want to purchase some kind of review management software because those can be, you know, pretty um, hard to manage if you're getting, you know, 20 a day or something like that. Or if some of them are, you know, uh, negative and you really have to think about responding to them, it's good to have a platform to do that on. So if you have a moving business, that might be the case, or a restaurant where you have tons and tons of people coming in. If you look at my business, we have like, I think it says 17 reviews on this snapshot. I believe we have more, oh yeah, 21. So, you know, we are not getting reviews every single day. We probably only do 24 projects a year or something like that. So we're not turning clients in and out the door, but the ones that do write things are really important because we do so many, you know, we don't do that many projects. So I've just put a list here of where you might want to start when you're asking people for reviews. Um, just feel free to ask them. You can call them, which is also a great way to build relationships with people, which is a whole other topic that I could do another full hour on. Um, you can email them or just private message them, send them the link to your review page, thank them, let them know how much you appreciate uh, their, their business and how much you appreciate you writing uh, them writing you a review. Uh, you can write reviews for them and you can write reviews for other people. That's something that I do myself. I love doing that. I love writing reviews about our business partners or services I use for my business and I do that quite regularly as part of our strategy. 
And if you have too many customers, then you need to invest in some type of reputation management software to manage that. And that's a really great thing to invest in. Like I said, if you're getting a lot of reviews, because it helps you to manage them. And, you know, it, I think it even tracks like who you uh, reply to, who replies back. So it's kind of a task management system inside of that. The next thing you want to do is make sure that you have photos on your page. So when people look up your, um, your business, your, your business listing tells a story about your business. So it tells where you are, it tells reviews about you, and then now you can show your business in pictures. And I love this. We get tons of views on our pictures. My business partner is always emailing me when we get our little, we get a little snapshot from Google that says, so many pictures have been viewed. Be, I can't believe 3,000 people have viewed our photos this week. That's a lot of people. But, you know, again, the, the photos tell a story. If you're a food-based businesses, business, you know, food shots can really help. People love to learn about people. So showing pictures of people in your business. Um, your customers can also upload photos if, if you want them to do that. I do that quite often, actually. I upload photos of places I go and put them on their pages and, and all your favorite pictures. I love having a picture of my team on here because it immediately puts faces to our business. I have a picture of the Mayor Fitchburg, if anybody recognized that guy. <laughs> so you can put anything like that on there that's going to tell a story. And then, like I just said, I write a lot of reviews for other businesses. And so right here, you can see that 30,000 people have viewed the pictures that I posted from the other businesses that I reviewed. So I tend to review businesses that I use for my business. So in this case, it's out of office, which is in Hudson, which is a co-working and event space. And I've held conferences there and different events. So I've put pictures up of all of that. And a lot of them have my three media web signature in them or my logo or anything like that. So it's, I'm promoting them, but I'm also promoting us. So it's kind of a win-win for both people. And there's one extra thing you can do on your um, Google My Business page. And I wouldn't recommend doing it every day because it's, you know, it's pretty tedious having to have another social media, um, social media channel to manage. But there are automated tools that you can use. So if you are blogging, you can get this WordPress tool that allows you to post, automatically post from your blog. So that can save you some time. Um, I don't know what's available for people that are not using WordPress. Um, my company specializes in WordPress. Uh, but you can just put it on your task management list to update your Google My Business post maybe once a week. And you can see like new views this week of the post. So it's just 23. So if you look at that compared to the pictures, you know, the pictures are obviously way more important. But this is still a really great way to show your customers that you care. Because when they look at your business on Google My Business, and they see, wow, they're posting every week, you know, it just gives you more value and more credibility as a company. So this is a really great tool. Um, to use. So that's Google My Business and those are all the things you can do on there and use that to the full extent. Um, the second type of search that I'm going to talk about is citation search. So when you uh, search in Google, the first thing that comes up at the top of your Google search is going to be Google Maps. Um, and I thought that I had a slide on this, but I didn't show it. Um, so maybe it's coming up next. But so the first top part of Google, your search will be Google Maps. So that's what I just talked about. And then as you scroll down the page, and Google Ads will be up there. And those are the paid ads. And I didn't, um, I'm not going to talk about those really today. That's a totally different topic. But um, so underneath that, you'll have citations with your listings on them. So very rarely will an individual individual business come up on the first page of Google unless it's something very unique like an uh, Indian restaurant in a specific area where there might only be like one or two. But typically what happens is the citations take over the first level of search. So that might be like a Yelp listing. I see that a lot if you Google like dentist. You'll see the Yelp dentist first before you see any dental listings come up. Uh, even with like web design agencies, there's four or five of those that will come up before your website, any individual website company will come up. So these are what are referred to as directories or citations. And so I have as an example here the Neshoba Valley Chamber website, which would be considered a directory. So if you're listed on there, um, that's a plus for your 
your SEO. And then to the right, I have all of the different location citations that you can get on, and I'll talk about this a little bit further. Um, so the citations are basically directory websites that you want to get listed on, and there's literally thousands. <laughs> so I did a basic search of what some of the top citation sources would be to get your website listed on. And I did accounting, advertising agencies, agricultural services, um, but you can do any, any industry that you're in and it will come up with what some of the best citation directories are for you to get on. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about the ones that I'm on, the advertising agencies. And honestly, from this listing, there's other ones on here that aren't on here, but they're more national citations. So maybe that's why they don't get found when I do the local search. Um, but there are certain directories that web design agencies can get on. And then inside of those agencies, um, inside of their listings, I can put pictures, reviews, projects, all different kinds of stuff like that. And I think they have those for various industries. So you can do these things on Yelp, which is free. You can, you know, set up your business. You can put tons of pictures on there. You can ask for reviews. You can do this on the BBB website. You can get reviews on theirs. If you're on the Chamber website, you know, you'll have a full listing on there with a link to your website. And, you know, you can have your logo on there. And some of the more basic ones are like Yellow Pages, super pages simply hired is considered a backlink but it's it's really a hiring website but again it lists your company it lists your logo so, so some of the citations that you want to be listed on these also could include social media as you'll see it says facebook here uh, linkedin so you want to make sure that you have these all set up for yourself maybe pick the top 10 and tackle those first maybe do some research and find out what the top ones are in your industry and you can do a search on these URLs that I've listed below. And so the way that I would do it for my clients or the way that I do it for myself right now is we have a citation manager. So we use a service and in that service we might have 500 directories, some have a thousand and that allows us to do like multiple updates or you know one update that that updates all of the different citations because these can get a little crazy to manage. Uh, but some of them I still manage by hand, like Yelp, I still go in and I have to update that every couple months. BBB, I go in there, I update that every few months. So the ones that are a little bit more important and have a little bit more information on them, I have a list of them and I'll go in every couple months. With Google My Business, I go in every single month. With the agency directories, I go in every single month. So I've added that to my workflow. And then that stuff counts back towards your SEO. So when when Google is measuring how you're going to get ranked, it's looking at all of these things. It's looking at these citations and backlinks coming from these different organizations. And some of the ones that are most important are social media because they, they have more weight when it comes to the backlinking um, algorithm that, that Google gives you. So you definitely want to get something like this set up. You can, you can either just manage 10 yourself or 20 yourself, or you can do a service which if you do Yaxt or Moz, they range between $500 and $1,000 for the whole year. So if you change an address, for example, it gets changed everywhere. You don't have to um, go back and change it, you know, 100 times or what have you. And the other cool thing about that is that Google looks at that information to make sure that's consistent across the board. So that also gives you more points when it comes to um, local SEO. I hope I'm not losing everybody. <laughs> I know it's not the most exciting information, but it's, I, I think it is. I love doing this stuff. I love going in and making sure everything's recent and updated and I have all my logos on there and my projects. So I enjoy the work myself. And I think partly the reason I enjoy it is because I know other people don't take the time to do it. So it puts me like 10 steps ahead of them. <laughs> so I, I really do take time to do this. So I've just given you some examples here of local citations and some industry specific citations that you might want to get your business on. And here again, I've listed the social media citations. So even if you're not doing social media, 
on a regular basis, it's still good to have a page because it is a directory. It will come up in the search engines when people search you. And like I said, if you're not coming up, somebody else's Facebook page is going to come up before you. So even if you're not posting regularly, you should still have a really great um, like listing or citation and have some of your great pictures in it. See if you can get some reviews and at least make it look like it's professional and up to date. And again, when all those things are consistent, Google is going to up your ranking when it comes to uh, local SEO. So first of all, there was the Google My Business for local SEO and foundation. And then I just talked about citations and backlinks. And the reason I did them in this order is because I believe this is the easiest way to tackle them. So um, you know, you might want to work on your Google My Business first, and then you might want to work on your citations second. And the third thing you might want to start to tackle is your website, because that's definitely going to be a little bit more work and involve a little bit more uh, brain power. Uh, but it's still really important. So the, the most important thing on your website is your contact information. So for best local SEO practice, your content information must be consistent and accurate throughout your website. And you might hear this uh, term NAP, is your website's NAP up to date or friendly or whatever. That's just your name, address, phone. It sounds so technical, right? <laughs> um, and so that's everything. Like some of your directory listings might have a PO box. Some might have a different phone number. Um, so you want to make sure everything from the citations is matching your website. You want to make sure that everything on your website is exactly the same and keep that accurate. And you know, best practice suggests that you have contact information in the footer of all of your pages so that it's the same. And you should have a designated contact page for your business and multiple contact pages for multiple locations. So you, some people might have separate websites for separate locations, and that's OK too. But they could still have a contact page for other locations, even if they have their own website, and then backlink to that other page. So, you want to have a contact page, probably has your address, all of your contact information, probably written out directions will help because Google likes for you to have up to 800 characters of text on your page. You could even do um, add your social media links on there. You could probably add some pictures of your business so people know what it looks like if they need to go there. And you could even throw in some reviews or you know just a little bit of information about the area you're in, what it's near. So those are just some ideas how to you know get a little bit better traction on those pages. There's something called um, schema markup on your website, and it's the location data for your website. And this is something you probably wouldn't know how to do because I don't even know how to do it. <laughs> um, but basically, what you do is you get the schema markup information of your location data, and you can ask your web company to to put it in for you. It's you know it's not a very um, daunting task for them, but for you it might be. But I did uh, put some information here for you if you did want to try to do it. There's also like an analyzer and an optimizer on you know, this, this website, uh, Neil Patel, an SEO optimizer. So you can run a scan through your website there and see what technical things need fixing. Um, and I put the URL, in, the URL in there also for the schema markup if you want to try that, or if you know someone who's technical and send them the link and tell them that's what you want to do rather than trying to explain it to them. So I put some resources there that uh, Melissa can send you after she can send you the presentation so you have all this information. Um, so it, when you run the, the Google technical uh, SEO optimizers, it will just tell you different things around your website that you can fix and it'll give you a whole link and you could even provide that to your web company and have them fix some of those errors. Uh, so Google's also going to look at page speed as one of the very top things. So address first, make sure that's all right. Second, Google page speed, how fast someone can access your website is a highly weighted score on Google. It is one of the top things that Google looks at. And it's because not just because it's fast, it's also because speed affects other data on your website. So how long somebody stays on there, whether or not they click in or not, whether or not they you know, they end up waiting and, and having that leg time waiting for your site and go away. All of those things um, can affect your SEO. And then there's also other things such as large photos on the site, missing data, and broken code. So 
going back to what we just talked about, fixing the technical issues. And if you run an SEO uh, test on those websites I provided, they'll probably tell you which pictures are too big, which data is missing. So all of these things go back to speed. They're all interrelated. So, you know, you want to fix all of these things so that they, they help you get um, a higher score on Google. And I also gave you the link to, to check your page speed. So I'm going to close these little windows on my computer. Um, so responsive is the third most important thing. So responsive means that people can see all the information that you would basically show them on your website on different, uh, different mediums, such as a tablet, such as their phone. And if it's not responsive or Google friendly, it's definitely time for an upgrade because this was something Google was talking about four years ago to have a must have. And at some point it will probably be a requirement. And if your website is not responsive, um, that's gonna bump you off any kind of searches on mobile or tablet or something like that. And they're not doing that right now, but they have said that they do plan to implement that in the future. And I put a responsive test link on here also. So you can uh, go back and Let's see how responsive your site is. And responsive can be somewhat up to the user's perspective. For example, just because you can see your website all in a phone doesn't mean that it's responsive. So that might just shrink your website and then nobody can see anything. So it does have to be sort of specifically designed for each device in mind. For example, when we design websites, we have three versions that we produce. We prefer we produce a web version, we produce a mobile version, and we pr produce a tablet version. And those kind of those move to each of those devices. And but that movement's very limited. But like getting top messages to the top, making sure phone numbers are at the top, and every single one is making sure that very important data is where it's supposed to be on all three of those devices, and that people can do the actions that you want them to do easily. If people can't find your phone number, then how are they gonna find you? If it's too small, how are they gonna see it? So those things are all really important when it comes to responsive, along with it being Google's in the top three. A little bit more complex here, I'm gonna start to talk about your copy and the layout of your site. So headings and subheadings are the ways that Google actually lists your website when it's when it goes to your website and it wants to show the user information, it goes to those headings to, for it to know what you're talking about on your page. So your headings and your subheadings, you need to make sure that they're descriptive and accurate of the page that they're on. So, you know, on your homepage, you don't want it to talk about something that's on another page. You want your homepage to talk about what's on your website in general. So, for example, 3 Media Web, a Boston web design, and marketing agency ours probably says something like that. But then on an inside page, it might say three media web, web design services for B2B businesses or something like that. So whatever the content is on that page should be what the headings and subheadings talk about, not just in the copy, but also in the, in the metadata, which I'm actually gonna talk about next. Um, so if you have different subheadings on your page and Google spiders through your page, it has a weighted um, response to what level of heading it is. And that's just, that's more of a technical thing. But on the back end of your website, there's certain ways that you code headings and subheadings. So Google will understand those better. And they look at those heavier than they might look at the text. So your heading might be how to implement you know, SEO or something. And then it would talk about that. So Google would look at that heading to clarify what's in that copy. And there are definitely like character and limitation rules. You don't want to have like two or three line titles. Um, not only does that not play well with Google because they look at it like it's keyword spamming, but it also doesn't look good to your user. They're like, why is this title like three lines long and it's huge text? So you want to think about usability. Um, and you can even use location and titles. So that helps with the local SEO part, but you don't want that to be overkill. Like, so you wouldn't want to have it in every top, you know, every heading, but maybe where, where it's relatable or it makes sense and it goes with the copy, you can put them in there. And the thing about SEO is none of it's guaranteed. So nothing is guaranteed. So, you know, don't feel like you do this stuff once and you're like, oh, it's not working. Then you can go back and change it and test different things. So that's a great way to do it. And if you're using WordPress, uh, there's a plugin called Yoast SEO. 
and that will help you with some of this stuff. It guides you through it. And they also have lots of user guides and different stuff like that on their website that you can use. So if you're not using WordPress and you don't have the plugin, it's still a really great resource for you. Um, but I think there is a plugin also for other platforms. It's just, it's just a different way of doing it. So Yoast is my number one recommendation when it comes to, you know, making your website really awesome for SEO. And page content, that's going to be, you know, what you're actually talking about on each page. Uh, you want to make sure it's relevant to the subject, the, the location, the services. You don't want to spam for keywords. Like lots of people will put, put, you know, web design Boston, web design Boston, web design Boston, like all through their text. Like Google does not like that. Um, and I know there's been people who've been like kicked out of Google for doing that. So, you know, I'm not sure if you've heard people talk about algorithm corrections, but you know, one week you could be on page one of Google and Google does an algorithm correction and they'll go and they'll look at your site again and make sure that you're adhering to all the Google guidelines. And if you're not, they'll bump you off. And, and that's happened to tons and tons of people um, with the algorithm up upgrade. So you want to, you don't want to try to trick Google. You don't want to, and like have hidden pages with tons of keywords. Like you just don't want to do any of that. You want to be on the up and up at all times. And using content from other websites is not acceptable unless you have permission or it's a quote or something like that. You can use testimonials from your, from your customers. That's fine. But it's basically double content. Google will look at it like it's double co duplicate content and it will ding you for that. So you want your content to be unique to your business. And if you're struggling with content, which is something that a lot of small businesses and large businesses deal with, uh, and you don't have somebody to help you with that and you want to do this on your own, testimonials and reviews from your citation websites is a really great piece of content that you can use. Uh, you can use high quality photos throughout your web pages. You can't really put tons of photos on websites just because they take so much time to download, but you can have web pictures on, you know, a couple pictures on every page. You could have up to five depending, you know, on the size of the pictures and what's on the page. You don't want to just have a page with a whole bunch of pictures, but you just use your, you know, use your common sense to how many pictures are on there. I suggest using pictures because it keeps people on the page a little longer. People like that. Um, you want to use interesting layouts such as columns and pull out quotes, shaded boxes. Again, just to kind of break up your content, keep people on your pages longer. The longer you can kind of keep people on your website, that's going to also help with your SEO because when somebody does a search and then they go to your website, the longer they are on it, that tells Google like this person really liked this website and they're on there for a while getting whatever they needed. So we're going to give them a few more points. I mean, they don't physically say that, but the algorithm says that. <laughs> um, you can create case study pages um, with your clients. That's one of my favorite ways to do SEO. Talk about what you did create a customer testimonial. For example, if you're a caterer and you catered a birthday party, you could write, you know, case study in a birthday party and the location. So that way when people type in catering for birthday parties in that location, that you might come up under Google searches for that. And again, that is how I um, got my success was being very specific with what I put on my website, target it to the places that I did it. And again, that just allowed me to get onto the, you know, the bigger searches. So it's a great place to start and it's a great way to build your business locally. So people love people. So you can always feature your team and stories about your team. Um, you can talk about everyday things on your website just to get um, some more content on there that's relevant and engaging because yes, content's important in terms of getting, you know, what people want to find on there. They also want to be interested. They want it to be interesting. They want to engage. So sometimes having your employees on there and stories about your business and different things like that can keep people on there and, and kind of make a better connection with you. Uh, so metadata is um, the tags that are behind the website. You don't really see them in the front end, but Google does see them. And the two main ones are the meta title and the description. And so there are guidelines for those. There's a word count, which should be in them. You want to make them unique to each page. You don't want a keyword spam. And again, I talk about installing Yoast. And if you go on the Yoast website, it will give you the, the guidelines for the meta titles and the descriptions. The descriptions are what Google actually shows. So when you search Neshoba Valley Chamber of Commerce, it will actually show the description as the as the um, as one of the search listings. 
and whatever Melissa has behind there as the company description will show up. And then meta titles are the titles that like appear at the very, very top, not in the search. You'll see them in the, um, in the, the bar, the top bar of your browser. Not all browsers always show them, or some people have browsers turned on and off, but they're still really relatable to SEO and local SEO, so you wanna make sure. I like to have those unique on every page. Some people don't, some people like to have them consistent, but you know, when people are on a page and they wanna know what page they're on, they see them at the top, the more descriptive. I think that's easier for them to move around. And again, the more user-friendly your website is, that's gonna get you more points in Google. So this stuff is all so interrelated and so important. And, and I think the smaller the detail seems, the more important it is. Because when you don't uh, focus on the details, I think that's where you miss out. So I think making sure all those things are just exactly perfect. And again, Yoast is such a great tool for that. So I think I pretty much covered everything without um, going too in depth or scaring anybody away. <laughs> um, but you guys can ask me anything, like Melissa said. Uh, and uh, what's my next slide here? <laughs> and then also I put all of my information here for you to connect with me and honestly I put a lot of content online so I do all of our PR and branding and marketing and, and I do a lot of our SEO so I have a pretty huge uh, knowledge base of information that I share and I'm always sharing it on these channels so if you follow me or connect with me I'm sure you'll learn lots from me and I'd love to connect with you guys and follow you guys and get to know other local companies and what you guys are doing and share your your stories with you know with my audiences so I've listed all the different ways you can connect with me here awesome thank you Lisa this is fantastic um, can you hear can you hear me yep okay so we do have a few questions so far that were um, let's see Jen asked what affects page feed and I'm going to, if Jen ha, wants to clarify, we can unmute Jen. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so Jen has asked, what affects page speed? Okay, so the first thing that affects page speed, <laughs> and I, I hate saying this, but it's going to be your host of your website. So even if you have a slow website, usually if you have a really good hosting company, your speed should still be pretty decent. And that's something that Google probably doesn't tell you in the speed test. But if you put your website into the speed test, so on the Google page speed link that I provided, it will list out all the things on your website that are slowing it down. Um, so if you, let's say, did that, it's going to list them and those are the things you can fix. But in my experience, it's your service provider. It's, your, the, it's usually a lot of code that's not needed on your site. So for example, if you're using a lot of plugins or using a lot of different codes and integrations on your website, that will slow it down. Uh, photos are a big culprit that I see people putting up like 10 meg photos on their website. Uh, so you just want to make sure that you're following all the the speed guidelines and again you can probably find those on Yoast if you do a little search on the Yoast website which I love I love that site there's also a um, moz.org which is a great website um, to talk about speed issues I um, had to I was using a theme on a website I did and I had to upgrade the whole theme because the theme was old so there's lots of things that you know cause it to be slow but I'm going to say number one is your hosting provider. Number two is going to be like a lot of pictures and number three is going to be a lot of integrations and too many codes. Okay. Thank you. Um, another question that we have from Beth is what should your page speed be? So I mean that's <laughs> that's I mean it would be great if it was super fast but I don't know if it, it actually doesn't give you an actual speed. I, there are certain sites that will but it will grade you so you just want to try to get the best grade so it will either tell you like if you're failing <laughs> so you want to get it up you definitely want to have a top grade like an a or something like that so you know you don't want it failing and the other thing it will test device too so if there's something on your website that's not affecting like a regular website as much as it would on a mobile website you can disable that for the mobile so for example if you have a slideshow for example and that doesn't really affect your, your regular website on a computer, 
um, but it affects it on a mobile, then you can like shut that, that sh slideshow off just for that specific you know, device. So those are just some tricks that you can do, but you definitely want to have a green. So it, it gives three circles, like a, a red is a fail, um, a yellow is, you know, you're doing all right, and then a green, you want to try to get to green. That's all the questions that we have. This was fantastic. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so great. Hearing Lisa.